presentation, we'll be talking about monetary policy, and in particular, we'll focus on the underlying mechanisms behind monetary policy. I really want this presentation to focus on what is going on with monetary policy. What is this that we can actually observe? What are the actual actions being taken place? The most important thing you should take out of this presentation is to dispel the notion that monetary policy is has this ethereal being to it. It is not relegated simply to academic PhDs at elite institutions. There's a very lively blogosphere right now that is actively debating the current conduct of monetary policy. Hopefully, after this presentation, you'll have a better idea of the key concepts that they're talking about. The following are going to be the key concepts that this presentation is going to talk about. Ultimately, what we really want to do is we want to understand what's going on. What is monetary policy? People keep on talking about this, raising this as an issue, and we really want to know, well, what is this? The second topic that this presentation will be addressing is how monetary policy actually works. In practice, what is it that we observe? What are the actions being taken? The third key concept that this presentation will discuss is the implications for market participants. People like you and me. What should we do knowing what monetary policy is? Should we go to the store and buy all the canned food and ammunition we can get? Or should we keep on going about our daily lives? Perhaps we should put all our money in the stock market. All these questions, ultimately, will be addressed. Before we go into the details, we need a little bit of motivation as to why we are discussing this topic. What is it about monetary policy that warrants our attention? The first key reason is that it, it seems important. It's ultimately an instrument of authority. A lot of legislation is written about how monetary policy should be conducted. Officials, parliamentarians, judges, and so forth often have much to say about how monetary policy should be conducted. It really is an instrument of our authority in day-to-day -day lives. The media as well focuses a lot on monetary policy and not just the financially focused media. Often in daily broadsheets, one will see central bank raise rates, central bank lower rates, so-and-so central banker made a policy announcement. Obviously, the media has a very hyper focus on this. The question is, why? Financiers, too, often pay a substantial amount of attention to monetary policy. And this is not due to the direct reason that they bet directly on monetary policy. In fact, besides interest rate swaps, which are a direct bet on the level of interest rates, many financiers, those that invest in stocks, those that invest in bonds, those that do all sorts of investments, pay very close attention to monetary policy and how it's conducted. And probably is a good idea to understand why. What we do know is that monetary policy relates to interest rates, and interest rates impact your my life and my life very well. Our mortgages, our credit cards, our student loans, everything relates to the interest rates somehow, in some way. And the question is, how does monetary policy relate to that key price that we pay when we want to borrow? Another reason why monetary policy seems important is that it impacts the economy. We know that monetary policy doesn't just follow the trends that are going on with the economy. Often it is used to change how the economic outlook is going forward. And the question is, how does this happen and why? Another motivation for this presentation is that monetary policy seems incredibly complex. There are many various actors in it. Some of the actors that I've listed include the government, the media, financiers. There's also people like you or me, foreign governments. There's so many players in this game. It makes the complexity really, really large. There are many mechanisms behind monetary policy. Is it that authority changes the interest rates, which change the economy, which causes the focus of financiers? That's one possible mechanism. Another mechanism is because it's a focus of financiers, the, the interest minutes of authority and media are, are interested in it. It's another perspective. Another is that it's the interest rates which drive the economy, which then the media and the authority and the financiers follow. The question is, which mechanism is right? Ultimately, this presentation will bear, shed a bit of light on that. Another fact is monetary policy is always changing. 
Today in, in Canada, we're talking in August 2012, interest rates are very, very low. That is, this is a very new recent phenomenon. Ten years ago, interest rates weren't this low. They were around 5-6%. Now they're around 2 2.5%. And, and the question is, well, why has this changed? Another is that there are not obvious effects. It's not obvious to you or me if monetary policy goes in one direction that we get this result. Because of the complexity that I've outlined, it's just not obvious that interest rates drive the economy which drive all these groups, or these groups drive the interest rates which drive the economy, and so on and so forth. It could be that these two just relate to each other and then all these three are doing their own thing. We're not sure. This presentation will help bear light on exactly what are the effects going on. To begin, I'd like to dispel a lot of misconceptions that prevail in public discourse about monetary policy. For those of you who are too young to know, this, this guy from The Wizard of Oz was the Great Wizard. He looks pretty scary, you know? Well, it turns out he's actually this guy. This fable directly relates to monetary policy. Fortunately, public discourse is too much like this guy, and when in reality it's actually this guy. There's simply a lot of noise generated in the media about monetary policy. A lot of people who are talking about things they don't clearly understand or have difficulty articulating. In truth, it is a very complex subject. However, it would be better if certain individuals did not say things that they didn't understand. Much of what is said is incoherent and honestly contradictory. Interest rates are low. That's a bad thing, but it could be a good thing, depending who you talk to. Ideally, we would like to clear through all this complexity. Here's just an example. So Subaru copying Bernanke excites demands for bonds. Blooper. That's not even a sentence. It just doesn't make any sense. What does this mean? He's copying Bernanke, but, you know, excites demand? How do you excite demand? Is demand a thing? What is demand for bonds? What kind of bonds? This is just a nonsense sentence, and I highly recommend that viewers of this presentation ignore sentences like these. It's just too much like The Wizard of Oz. I suggest that you ignore any comments made by mainstream media slash politicians about monetary policy. They have an active interest in misleading voters about monetary policy because it makes them look more powerful, more capable, and in, according to certain theories, can actually make monetary policy more effective. However, for you, the individual person who is sitting here watching this video, I highly suggest you just ignore what these people have to say. What I do recommend, in turn, if you're very interested in monetary policy, is to focus on blogs. In particular, Paul Krugman's blog and Scott Summer's blog are absolutely excellent sources of good monetary policy discussion. The first question that we'll be addressing is what is monetary policy? In one sentence, monetary policy is a strategy regarding the issuance of liabilities by a central bank to purchase assets. One definition of liabilities is obligations from the central bank to other people. While assets are obligations from other people to the central bank that are under the central bank's control, liabilities are outside the control of the central bank, while assets are within the control of the central bank. If you see here, ultimately it's the printing of money to purchase assets, or in this case, monopoly money for coconuts. Monetary policy is about the strategy of how much money do I print to buy how many coconuts? In this example, this ultimately begs the question, what is a central bank? A central bank is a sovereign guaranteed bank that provides financial services on its behalf. When I say sovereign, I mean a country such as Canada, the United States, China, many other countries, countries that are fully within their own control. One could think of this as you setting up your own bank for yourself. A central bank ultimately serves that function for these countries. The services that the central bank provides for its sovereign are issuing higher powered money, and in this case monopoly money, settling interbank debts, managing the government finances, and implementing monetary policy. Notice how monetary policy is only one of four different financial services that the central bank provides. 
Some people would argue that it's the primary focus, but it is not the sole focus, and that's why central banks have very large staff. It is because they do all these other roles besides strictly implementing monetary policy. Another fundamental question that we have to ask ourselves is, what is money? What, what is this? What is this paper that we carry in our pockets, or these numbers on our screen that just flick up and down? Money is ultimately a promise. It's a promise, it's a liability by the central bank. It's a promise by the central bank to pay me. For those of you who are more financially sophisticated, you can think of it as a zero coupon bond with an infinite maturity date. You could also think of it as a put option on a nominal claim of goods and services. A put option is something that gives you the right, but not the obligation, to sell something at a given price. And in this case, it's the right, not the obligation, to sell the money that you have for a certain set of goods and services at a fixed price. This is a very important point that I really want to emphasize. Money is ultimately backed by the full faith of the government. That is what's standing behind money, is you and me and our tax revenue is what backs all money. If our tax revenue disappears, the money is behind it is worthless. That is the ultimate driver of money's value. The question is, why do people like you and me use money and bestow upon governments such power? And the answer is government fiat. The government literally says, all your taxes have to be paid in my issued paper. If you could imagine, you as a sovereign and you have 10 citizens, you go to the citizens and say, hi citizens, I'm going to give you liabilities to purchase assets. With these liabilities, you can give back to me at the end of the day when you need to pay your taxes for certain assets. There's also a very strong convenience factor that helps money. And simply that there's an infinite supply of it, and because governments are so big and they have such large tax bases, it's a very large liquid market that's very easy for me to give to other people. Here's a nice thing that about the British pound is it says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds. That is, explicitly on the note of British paper, it is a promise to pay that bearer. And ultimately, that is what money is about. I'd like to dwell for a moment on why is it that money has to be fully backed by government and ultimately the taxpayers of the sovereign in question. The answer is, is that without this banking, money itself would have absolutely no value. I'll give you an example. When people lose faith in the value of their money, examples of this include the German government in after World War I, Zimbabwe more recently. What happens is, is that people lose faith in the value of their money. The only way that the government can maintain that faith is by taking its money and trading it for something that people do value to rebase the currency. If you could think about it, let's just say you were sitting there in your table with stacks of notes. You have to find a way to make it so that people value these stacks of paper in front of you. The only way that you can make those stacks of paper valuable is to give something that people actually value besides those stacks of paper in return and make some conversion rate between your paper and what people value. Governments also face the same dilemma. If people lose faith in their stacks of paper, they have to find a way of giving things that people actually value in lieu of those stacks of paper to make them convertible. It means that the governments will have to collect via taxes goods and services that individuals actually value and trade those goods and services for the paper that they issue. That way, relative to the amount of paper, there's more goods and services that people value. This way, Governments implicitly back the money that they print. This exchange never actually has to happen. It only happens in rare cases when the confidence of the central bank is tested. But always backing that underlying paper is the assumption that should things go badly, the government will step in, recapitalize the central bank via its ability to tax, and renominate the value of its liabilities, or in this case, paper. One topic that I'd like to address is what is it that makes central banks so special? Often when you hear the media, you'll imagine that 
Central bankers are these sages with magical powers that change the direction of the future economy. But in reality, in the current monetary regime, which is a fiat monetary regime, and a fiat monetary regime is one where our central bank has full discretion as to how it can expand or contract its balance sheet. Central banks are not that special. What does make them special, however, is that the liabilities are a unit of account. That means that all contracts referenced under Canadian law and referenced in relation to Canadian parties are written in terms of the liabilities of the central bank. My salary is governed in units of Canadian dollars, which are a liability of the Canadian central bank. That means that the Canadian central bank implicitly controls the reference point for all those contracts. And that's really, in a fiat regime, what is so special about these liabilities. This doesn't necessarily have to be the case, though. Exceptions to this include the gold standard, fixed exchange rates, and baskets of goods. In this case, the central bank, instead of having discretion over its balance sheet, decides that all contracts and the reference value of its liabilities be pegged to a specific value. It could be gold, it could be another central bank's liabilities in the case of ex fixed exchange rates, or it could even be a basket of goods. And in this case, the central bank says, the value of my liabilities is always going to be pegged at some ratio to this external good slash service. In the current monetary regime that we live in, which is a fiat monetary regime, we have flexible exchange rates and banks that can, central banks that can act at their own discretion. This means that the value of money in, in this world is determined by the willingness of the sovereign to commit future goods to that money and also the private valuation of the individuals who use that money on the value of that commitment. If you could imagine, it's almost a dance, a waltz. The government, standing on one side, is trying to assess the value of other people in its liabilities insofar as its ability to take goods from the people and allocate them to its money. And on the other hand, the people's valuation of the government's ability to do that and the value of those goods in turn. It's, it's, it's a self-fulfilling loop, if you will. In this world, money is equivalent to sovereign-issued credit. Although it's, it's a very certain kind of credit, it is equivalent to that because it's involving the future commitment of goods. Because money is equivalent to credit, there's no anchor to the quantity of money in the system. Because I'm bringing to the present all forward values of my future income, there's no natural limit on how much future income I can bring forward or how little future income I can bring forward, or on the converse, how much I could save for future income. There's no anchor. When you have a fixed exchange rate, the anchor is the value of gold, the basket of goods, the actual exchange rate. But in this regime, you have no anchor. And that means that me, as a central banker, I can expand my balance sheet as much as I want, or I can contract it as much as I want, depending on the willingness of people to accept my liabilities. Central banks in this regime literally create money at will. What happens when... Federal Reserve engages in quantitative easing is literally an analyst at a desk in the New York Fed, sits on a computer, types some numbers in, and within the accounts of the banks, numbers flip. Literally, that's what happens when a central bank creates money. It literally creates money at will. It flips numbers on a switch. The private banks under this regime, they operate under the same principle. They don't need deposits with the central bank to lend money. They can simply lend money out and borrow to cover the deficit, knowing that the central bank can always print money to increase the amount of money in the system. It doesn't involve a transfer. That means I don't need to save money to lend. I can lend and then cover my deficit. This is an example of the balance sheet of your modern central bank. You'll have assets and liabilities. Among those assets, you could have gold, government bonds, foreign exchange, but you also have liabilities, and they're in the form of high-powered money, bank reserves, that is, money that commercial banks will put with the central bank for overnight lending, and also equity, which is the residual between assets and liabilities. 
In the Bank of Canada, the government explicitly owns the equity of the central bank. The following is going to be a presentation to help you understand, in a very simplified model, exactly the dilemma facing a central bank and how a fixed exchange rate regime works. Hopefully, it should help you understand exactly how monetary policy interacts with the trade of real resources. In this, in this world, let's imagine that we have Blossom. And Blossom here has a coconut. In this very simplified economic model, we also have Buttercup. And Buttercup has a certain amount of money. Let's just say it's one unit of money that she trades with Blossom. That means that in this world, we have Blossom and Buttercup, and they're trading a coconut for money, and it's just going around and around and around. In this world, we also have a central bank, and the central bank is a fixed exchange rate central bank. And the central bank, it's going to peg one unit of money, or one dollar of money, to one coconut. Now let's imagine that things are going very well for Blossom and Buttercup. And Buttercup here thinks, well, instead of just trading my coconut with Blossom here, what if I plant that coconut and grow some coconut trees, and then we can get more coconuts? In that case, Buttercup, she needs to issue some IOUs and print some money to discount that future value of that expected increase in coconut production. In this case, she's going to tell Blossom, listen, Blossom, I expect in the future, more coconuts. I'm going to issue some IOUs in the form of money, and you can give me your coconut. In this case, what we have is we have more money circulating. That is, we have a lot more money circulating relative to the amount of coconuts in this economy. And if you remember our central bank here, they promised that they would only have one dollar for one coconut. But in reality, we have, let's say, three coconuts for ten dollars. We used to have a ratio of 1 to 1, and now we have a ratio of 10 to 3. This is a problem for the central bank, because they promised $1 for one coconut. And if, at any point in time, Blossom were to come over to the central bank and trade her money for coconuts, the central bank would have to break the peg and be in default, because it broke that value, it broke that promise. However, let's say we have Bubbles here, and Bubbles has a whole bunch of coconuts. She's just sitting over them. What can happen is the bank, via the central bank, via taxation, the issuing of notes, or many other forms, can collect coconuts from Bubbles and put it in its vault. Once it's collected coconuts from Bubbles and put them in its vault, then we get a higher balance between the amount of money in circulation and the number of coconuts in circulation. That is because in this world, all of a sudden, with all this money, Blossom here, who is worried that, hey, listen, I have a lot of money, and this money's nice, but she's thinking, well, it'd be nice to have some more coconuts. And she walks over to the central bank and exchanges some of her money, which, by the way, originally was printed by Buttercup in anticipation of future income growth and trades it for coconuts. In this case, the coconuts that she's buying are actually coconuts from Bubbles here. This shows that under a fixed exchange rate regime, when one, when a bank, and in this case it would be Buttercup, when a bank issues money to borrow, when it lends, it involves the transfer of actual resources in the economy. That means that Bubbles here has to transfer coconuts to Blossom. In a fiat world where we don't have these fixed exchange rates, none of that has to happen. What will happen in our scenario is that when the central bank takes these coconuts from bubbles, either via taxation or note issuance, we can get an equilibrium back to two coconuts and two dollars within this entire economy. Assuming that bubbles for now keeps her coconuts on reserve, while Blossom and Buttercup keep on exchanging their money for coconuts. We'll now be talking about central banks and interest rates and their relationship. The interest rate is the discount that is placed between current consumption and future consumption for reasons of risk or because opportunity costs in the sense of money now you can invest 
the value of future consumption is worth less than consumption right now. That is the interest rate. There are two sources of this differential between current consumption and future consumption. Or if you can imagine, where does this money ultimately come from? Where do these, how are these resources allocated? One is the transformation of current consumption to future consumption. If you could imagine back to a world where a mostly agricultural economy and we had a choice between eating food now and planting it to harvest, one transformation of current consumption to future consumption is taking my grain, planting it in the ground, hoping for it to grow, and then collecting those future proceeds. The second way that we can trade off between current consumption and future consumption is the transfer of current consumption to future consumption. I can transfer between individuals who do not need to consume right now, while I need to consume right now, and vice versa. This is very different than the first method. In the second method, there's just a, a trading of consumption in the current point, in different points in time. While in the transformation component, the current consumption in the economy actually drops because I'm taking those resources and investing them for the future. These two concepts are related, but they're very, very distinct. And both of them determine the current interest rate. Monetary policy tries to influence the latter, or the transfer of current consumption to future consumption, while the former, or the transformation of current consumption to future consumption, is determined by economic fundamentals. Central banks have no control over the rate of return on current consumption. They can only control the amount of aggregate lending and borrowing that's happening at one period in time. This is why lending and saving does not always equal investment. There are many simplified macroeconomic models that make this assumption, but this is a very strong assumption and arguably incorrect. By expanding and contracting its balance sheet, the central bank can influence the amount of aggregate savings slash lending in the economy. Due to its fact that it is a creditor and it can issue liabilities at will, that means that the total amount of saving and lending can be influenced by the central bank. Other actors, however, can counteract the central bank's actions. If you could imagine, in anticipation of the central bank lending more tomorrow, you could lend less today, or vice versa. You could lend especially more today because the central bank will be lending tomorrow. All these complexities and these sub-games make it very difficult to understand exactly how monetary policy influences the real economy. In practice, monetary policy is a very, very messy affair. Businesses and households governments, all agencies in the economy, interact with monetary policy by borrowing and lending. This makes the central bank's job very, very difficult because every action that it makes is counteracted in some level by other actors within the economy or could be enhanced or turbocharged. The expansions and contractions of credit in these groups can easily overpower monetary policy. In the sense that overpower, if the private sector is deleveraging at a rate of 30% per annum, there's very little the central bank can do beyond printing money, and even in that case, it's very difficult for it to change the overall stance of credit in the economy. The actions of these agents are jointly determined by the actions of the central bank. That means that the private sector, looking at what the central bank does, makes its decisions, and the central bank, in turn, looking at what the private actors do, make their decisions. And both of these groups together make decisions together they wouldn't have made separately. That's what I mean by they're jointly determined. This makes reasoning for monetary outcomes highly tenuous. The current low interest rate environment is not a result of lax monetary policy. Scott Summer says, he's a, he's a very good monetary blogger, you cannot reason from a price change. And ultimately, you cannot reason from a change in interest rates. It's not obvious if it's a change in the real economy, a change in what the central bank is doing, a change in what the actors are doing. It's just very hard to reason from this and be highly skeptical of any commentary that reasons from the current interest rates. The application of monetary policy can be extremely complex, and it varies by the particular arrangements of the central bank. The U.S. Federal Reserve System, for instance, is an exceptionally complicated system whereby you have many divisions of central banks who in turn make 
joint monetary policy decisions, but have the separate actions. The European Monetary Union is another example, or the ECB is another example of a very complicated central bank arrangement. In contrast, banks such as the, bank in, the central bank in Sweden are very, very simple and easier to understand as far as how they apply monetary policy. They simply buy or sell government bonds to expand or contract their balance sheets at will. It is important to understand that the overnight lending rate is not the main conduit by which central banks engage in policy. The overnight lending rate determines a very small portion of aggregate credit lending in the economy, only a few hundred billion in the case of the Federal Reserve Bank, and it is an indicator of future monetary policy stance. But ultimately, the actual decisions or actions made by the central bank are never determined by the rate at which it lends to banks in the overnight. That's why it's very important to look at the central bank's balance sheet, i.e. is the balance sheet expanding or contracting on net, and ignore the transmission mechanisms. The transmission mechanisms make it very difficult to understand exactly what's going on, but if you can look at the balance sheet as a whole, is it expanding, is it contracting, that can give you a very good idea of the current stance of monetary policy. Here's a simple rule that I've used myself. Bigger balance sheet is an expansionary monetary policy, and a smaller balance sheet is a contractionary monetary policy. An example of the complexities of how the transmission mechanism works is interest on reserves. It's been a very controversial decision by the Fed back in October 2008 to pay interest on reserves. This means that money that commercial banks deposit with the Federal Reserve will collect interest on those deposits. Many commenters have argued that this is in fact a contractionary policy and not a very wise thing to do in such a fragile time. What hopefully you'll understand from the following is that it actually doesn't matter where the money is situated in the Federal Reserve System. In a fiat monetary regime, the actual location of money does not determine the allocation of resources. That means that if commercial banks put their money with the Federal Reserve, it doesn't actually influence the lending in the real economy. The issue of how is it that the Federal Reserve, by providing interest on reserves, doesn't impact the overall amount of lending and investing in the economy. This is a very complicated point, but it's important to understand the mechanics of money in a fiat regime. Ultimately, in a fiat regime, money is created instantaneously by the agents within that regime. Let us imagine that in this world, we have Blossom. We also have a bank that services Blossom. We also have, in this world, a central bank, which is the bank of Blossom's bank. In this world, Blossom's primary decision is whether or not she should invest in a fruit tree. She can consume fruits from that fruit tree or plant those fruits to make more fruit trees and subsequently more future fruit. The role of the central bank in this economy is to take real deposits from the commercial bank that Blossom interacts with and provide an IOU or a note saying this is what the central bank holds for you on its behalf. In this world, the central bank can offer interest on these notes to the commercial bank within deposits held at the central bank. Let us imagine that Blossom gets excited and decides that she wants to create many, many fruit trees. The only way she can do this is to borrow money now to invest for the future. And what she will do is issue IOUs and deposit them with her commercial bank. The commercial bank, in turn, will provide Blossom with cash from its reserves. Or, if it doesn't have reserves, with cash borrowed from the central bank. In this case, in this economy, the creation of money occurs by Blossom deciding that she wants to invest in fruit trees and creating IOUs. That's the only money that's created in this economy. Why is that the case? Because the money that the commercial bank gave to Blossom to invest in the fruit trees 
is going to sit at another commercial bank. This will happen via her suppliers or another bank. Eventually, the banks will collect the money. The money has to go somewhere. People don't hold it within their mattresses. Someone has to take this money and deposit it somewhere. Those depositors, in turn, will indirectly deposit it with the central bank. That means that it doesn't matter where the money is put at the end of the day, because the real investment is Blossom issuing IOUs and taking the proceeds of that and investing it in fruit trees. That IOU issuance, that trading of a future fixed cash flow for current cash, that is the lending, that is the creation of money. It is not whether the money is sitting with the central bank or the commercial bank or in any other financial institution in the economy. The location of the money doesn't matter. What matters is that Blossom here is able to invest and issue coupons. If you remember back to the previous presentation where the central bank had a fixed exchange rate, in that regime, actual resources had to be transferred from one party to another, from Bubbles to Buttercup and Blossom, in order to keep the fixed exchange rate constant. But in this world, in a fiat money regime, where central banks can print at will, you do not have that anchor. There is nothing to determine the supply of credit in the economy. In that case, Blossom at will creates money. This means that the commercial bank doesn't have to borrow money from the central bank in order to lend to Blossom. It can give money to Blossom, take the IOUs that Blossom has given it, and go to the central bank and request money, knowing the central bank can print money. There are few potential mechanisms for monetary policy to influence the real economy. The first mechanism is by interest rates. Under this argument, businesses use as a key input in determining whether to invest or not. The higher the interest rates, the lower the investment. The lower the interest rates, the higher the investment. In this way, if the central bank were to conduct expansionary monetary policy and lower the real interest rate, businesses in turn will invest more due to the lower real returns that their investments have to achieve. The second possible mechanism is nominal GDP. Under this mechanism, businesses respond to the real prices that their goods face when they are deciding whether to invest or to conduct business. If prices on their goods are rising, they see that as an indication to expand investment, and if prices are dropping, they see that as a reason to contract investment. In this way, if a central bank were to conduct expansionary monetary policy, nominal GDP or the aggregate value of transactions that happen in the economy grows, all businesses will see this as an indication that they need to continue to grow and invest. Another potential mechanism is the composition of credit in the economy. That is, the duration of credit within the economy. Credit has many different kinds of payment periods. You have very long-term bonds that can last for up to 20 years, and very short-term notes that can last for 30 days. By purchasing long-term treasuries and issuing short-term notes, the central bank can actively influence the composition of credit circulating within the economy. That means that if businesses at certain margins need to be able to issue certain kinds of credit with certain payment periods, then the central bank can influence how they borrow and their ability to access those funds. Monetary policy can also influence the aggregate amount of credit in the economy. If you could imagine, there's no tethering of the overall size of the central bank's balance sheet. It means that the central bank can rapidly expand its balance sheet and issue more liabilities to purchase more assets, or it can rapidly shrink its balance sheet and purchase its liabilities while selling its assets. Under this mechanism, it is the overall amount of credit that determines as to how businesses make decisions when investing and saving. Another potential mechanism for monetary policy is via exchange rates. This is especially so for small open economies. The exchange rate determines 
the effective price of exports that that economy produces. By expanding and contracting its balance sheet, the central bank can effectively change the real exchange rate of the exported goods and services in a small open economy. That in turn can make the economy's exporters more or less competitive in the global marketplace. Another potential mechanism is the perceived wealth mechanism. This mechanism specifically relates to consumers in the economy. Under this mechanism, consumers will only consume if they have a certain nominal value of wealth on their balance sheets. In this case, the central bank can expand or contract its balance sheet and determine how people perceive their wealth in nominal terms. In that case, they will increase or decrease their consumption based on their relative position of their fixed set of wealth. Another potential mechanism is asset values. This particular mechanism relates to bankruptcy and how failure within a corporate organization on a mass scale can influence the real economy. The argument behind this is that if asset values drop below a certain nominal level, then there will be joint contingent cascading effects that will cause many of the businesses to be non-viable and will limit the ability of the economy to specialize and trade. The implicit argument behind this is that if there are a certain number of bankruptcies and they happen with a certain speed, then the entire corporate structure of the economy will be insolvent and need to be reorganized, while in reality only a fraction of that restructuring needed to occur. Many of these mechanisms may turn out empirically to be false or have yet to be truly tested. The interest rate mechanism to expand the economy has been shown empirically to be false. Business investment is not sensitive to changes in interest rates as long as interest rates are in the single digits, which is the way it is in the vast majority of economies in the world. Overall, as to which mechanism is the most influential, it is still a matter of debate. A question that this presentation would like to address is what should you do? The first thing you should do is not panic. Monetary policy is a very abstract concept and is larger than any one individual's ability to influence. It really shouldn't be the primary factor in your decision to engage in any activity. Most interest rate environments are very stable. That means, given the current interest rate environment, there's a very high likelihood that the, it will persist for a very long time. That entails, for those of you making investment decisions, it's a very good idea to base those decisions upon a low interest rate environment for a very long period into the future. Another lesson that you should try to take is don't try to forecast interest rates. It's a very difficult thing. There are many banks and hedge funds who lose a lot of money making such bets. I highly suggest that you do not base your decisions on your ability to forecast the future interest rates. Interest rates are often hit by very sudden shocks. When they change, it happens very quickly, and the magnitude is very fierce. One could see a rapid rise in interest rates, as is happening now in Europe, or one could see a very quick drop in interest rates, as happened in fall 2008. Interest rates are not mean reverting. That means there is no use in modeling interest rates as converging to a long-run average. They simply stay where they are for very long periods of time until sudden shocks hit them, causing them to change to a new plateau. This makes it not a reasonable assumption to have that interest rates are mean reverting. Another thing you should do is avoid embedded optionality. Embedded optionality refers to the right, but not the obligation, to engage in a certain kind of financial transaction. Many mortgages in the States have the option of refinancing. In Canada, it is often much more expensive to refinance your mortgage. It is a good idea to avoid financial products that have embedded interest rate optionality, and that is because such optionality is very expensive. By buying an option, it implies that you have a better ability to understand the future potential interest rate environment than the person who is selling it to you, or in this case, the financial institution. And usually, that is not the case. Another lesson you should take is to seek variable interest rate exposures. When you engage in a fixed interest rate exposure, it entails that you believe that the current interest rate is a very good rate 
for all contingencies in the future. When you have variable interest rate exposures, it's a much safer proposition because other parts of your income statement will respond as well to the changes in the interest rates. For instance, if the economy does very poorly, chances are central banks will lower interest rates. On the one hand, this will increase the likelihood that you will lose your position and reduce your income from investment. On the other hand, this will provide you with lower interest payments in the form of mortgages. In that case, it is not always a good idea to get fixed interest rates as you lose that natural hedge. Thank you.